Welcome, everybody, to Nargis and Walter chatting non duality. Welcome, Nargis. Thanks. Nice to nice see to you. Be here. Thank you. Um, so, you are at Nargis Non Duality on YouTube. And you just told me your website, unconditional freedom.com. And that's going to be uh, going live mid December. Yes, in a few weeks. Yeah. <clears throat> Very exciting. I'm still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> Won wonderful. So we chat non duality on here, and I was on your page. And uh, first thing I came across was a, um, a pinned post that says, Please, men, have your honor. Don't call me via messenger and don't approach me for small talk. When my inbox is too full, I can't see, respond to people that have a genuine question that need to ask about awakening or realization. Thank you for understanding. I, I thought that was really um, profound because, you know, <laughs> I had no idea that that was going to be uh, an issue for, for me as either was uh, all these messages. And um, you're right, a lot of them, small talk, they just go, hey. And you're like, yeah, what am I supposed to do with that? Um, so I don't, since it was a pin post and I've seen other speakers kind of um, emphasize this, that, um, you know, not just to send uh, random messages or, you know. Um, oh, who, yeah, it's yeah. here. If someone has a question, they can just directly ask it. If they go like, hey, how are you? I don't know if they have a question or they just want to chat and you know yeah if you post on facebook public i uh, you get like a lot of invites i got like thousands of invites and they're still running like i'm on my limit now so uh, that's kind of a facebook thing so people that are not even interested in non-duality also approach me so that's why it's a bit confusing that's why i posted that post uh, but it's all fine yeah yeah that's why I don't really um, respond that well on Facebook. On Instagram, it's actually better. It's more filtered. Only people that are really interested in what I talk about are following me on Instagram. But on Facebook, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I do is on YouTube. So I'm pretty, I, a little bit on uh, Instagram, but definitely yeah. not Facebook. I completely yeah. stopped anything. Yeah, YouTube is really. fine. Yeah. yeah really enjoy youtube and have enjoy enjoyed it and now we're, with my channel posting videos um it's just lovely to also see people react on it and and to hear that people also really um enjoying it but also getting like insights it's just enjoyable to 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 be able to to post these days because yesterday i was watching uh ram das going home on netflix uh-huh and I saw that in back in the days, people would really travel to India to get a little bit of information. <laughs> and nowadays we have everything on our fingertips, tips <laughs> yes, on yes. YouTube for free. It's wonderful. It's completely amazing. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, you'd have to travel and uh, be able to sit at the feet of the master. And now you can just do it from the comfort of your own home. While eating chips. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So why don't we get into it? I just wanted to say that because I thought that was a, a good thing, although it's not particularly non-duality related, but I thought it would be helpful to just put out that as a maybe a, a, something for the listeners to consider that if they're going to message somebody, maybe have something to say. Um, so that's actually also non-duality. <laughs> non-duality arising as that post. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Sure. The absolute arising as that post, emptiness arising as a pinned post on Facebook. <laughs> yes, in that sense, everything is non-duality. I guess I just think it. of the the subject is something. Uh, the subject itself is something to be discussed. Uh, obviously, this is what we're doing. Uh, we're not talking about cars. We're, you know, 
but I understand what you mean by that, that um, this is uh, no thing appearing as everything. So it's appearing as whatever arises in this moment and there are no exceptions. So it could be a conversation about cars, but I wanted to ask you about enlightenment. Uh, you wrote enlightenment is the end of experience. Yes, correct. Could you elaborate? I, I love that. Uh, that statement is very brief but powerful yeah it is yeah um it's basically what's happening is already whole and complete and within what's happening there is this body and whenever there is still this illusion of separation running it thinks that it is experiencing life that there is this body here there is a me inside a body that experiences li life, for instance, rain, that experiences rain. Well, in reality, it's just the whole thing, the whole thing apparently happening. So there is nobody that experiencing something else. And those two are actually don't even collapse, the experiencer and the experienced, so the, the, the apparent person and the rain are not two separate things. So that's why it is after realization or alignment, it is seen that there was never an experiencer. It just seemed that way. So there was actually no, never an experience. It only felt that way. So those two don't even collapse into one. It's just seen that there never was a separation between those two. It was just a whole thing. Yeah. Wow. So the rain falling, and then this uh, subjective experience of rain hitting me and the feeling of that, um, that's all one apparent happening. Yeah, and including the air of the sky and the bench that you might be sitting on while it's raining, including the trees that are in the view there, it's including everything, the whole view, the whole thing. Apparently. Yeah. We could also say there was never an experience or an experiencer. No, true. But so enlightenment, when you say it, it is the end of experience, uh, does that just mean that the, the, I guess what I mean is there never was an experience, there never was an experiencer. So what is enlightenment? It's the realization that there isn't anyone that is experiencing life. There isn't anyone that's, that that life is happening to. And there is no one to become enlightened. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so it's a realization for no one. Exactly. It's a freedom for no one. Hmm. all right well, well say, sorry go ahead I, I heard someone say also on youtube a non-dual speaker i just forgot her name she's wonderful maybe i'll remember it later but she said enlightenment is an empty prize for no one oh, empty prize <laughs> for no one is that lisa cans no no uh, an older lady yeah 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 oh okay older lady Ah, uh, Rosemary, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a good one though. I just wanted to give her credit for that, but that's all right. Well, uh, yeah. an empty prize for no one. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you, you're right, experience and experiencer are realized to be one. Nobody is experiencing life, life is. There is nothing that can be said about this, yet speaking and writing happens. No word can contain this. No feeling can describe this. It's not special, yet wonder arises daily. Can you talk about uh, some of that, like this wonder that arises? Yeah, it's exactly the wonder. There are just a very, a lot of moments during the day since 
the illusion stop happening, the illusion of separation, is that I'm just completely in wonder, like, wow, how is it possible that no, no thing is arising as everything and disappearance apparently happening? And I just look around myself and then I'm like, wow, isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful? Because everything is so unknowable. Well, like I also used to say, enlightenment is unknowing. So whenever a tree is seen, it is as if I see that tree for the first time. And it is that way. It is not placed in a box of knowing. Like, oh, I already saw, saw that tree and it's boring. So everything is fresh. Everything is new. Everything is alive. Everything vibrates. Everything breathes. And that creates this wonder. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Mm. Life is. I like that. It's just a simple sentence. Life is. Yeah. Forever grateful to teachers and speakers that gave clear and direct pointers forever in my heart. When they die, I'm sure I'll be moved with tears. I love being human. I love to be. Yeah. The love yes. to be. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. What's it like being it, human? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just completely. Oh, how can I put it? It's so fulfilling. It's so fulfilling. Is human endeavor is so fulfilling there is no separation yet there is this composition and this contrast that are so enjoyable the contrast of sadness and joy is so enjoyable both are beautiful in their own way so how is sadness um enjoyable or beautiful yeah it's so intimate sadness is every emotion is intimate but for me especially after um falling away with the or the, the illusion stopped happening it was so <clears throat> clear that sadness is such a profound and intimate emotion it really shows the vulnerability of this human humanness it's such an honor to be able to feel that really since there is no resistance towards anything anymore it is enjoyable because it's a contrast it's another flavor of life it's it's being touched yeah well there is no one to touch but yet there is this sensation of being touched, which is just profound. And at the moment that I wrote that post, I was just feeling so much gratefulness for, for, my, for the teachers that I met um, and learned from, or the teachers that destroyed me <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. And then all of a sudden, there was this little subtle feeling of sadness, like, oh, oh. And when they're not here anymore, like their bodies will die. And then there was this sense of sadness just by that thought. And it was just beautiful. So then that, that post was written. That is yes, very because there's so much love and so much gratefulness. Yeah. For, or for the people that made the effort to point to what already <clears throat> is. I have great uh, gratitude also um, in that way, but also just seemingly for the message itself. Yeah. yeah. Which is weird without anybody attached to it necessarily. Yeah. Um, just the message of this is it. 
Yeah. And what you're saying, the sadness and the joy and the variety of emotions that can arise, they're all welcome. And they, yeah. they're all celebrated in a way. Yeah, exactly. You know, they want to be celebrated, if I may <laughs> put it that way. They want to be felt so they can move. Yeah, emotion is actually energy in motion. It wants to move. It doesn't want to be stagnated, resisted, avoided, put away in a dark box. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I felt, I feel that too. Like people say it's energetic and I, I feel that, um, like you're saying, it wants to go somewhere. Things want to yeah. be expressed. Things... When I say things, energy, feelings, emotions, yeah. sensations, they rise up and they want to be, they yeah. want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They want to be acknowledged and honored mm. and embraced. Yeah. Because then they can show their beauty. If they're resisted, they become distorted. The energy distort becomes distorted. And it can appear not that beautiful although it's still beautiful but yeah i talk i talk a lot of a lot about emotions because in in this world of non-duality i come across a lot of bypass bypassing mm -hmm. yeah in spirituality bypassing happens but it also happens with non-duality with one-on-one -on -one coaching um or the one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations that i have with people i come across that in every conversation so that's why I also start, I talk about a, a lot of about emotions. Yeah, because, you know, realization is not an insight. It's not a conceptual insight. It's really an, an energetic shift. And before that energetic shift happens, there is this opening of the body that becomes more and more in feeling safe. The body becomes feeling safe to feel. Yes. And, and open so the life force can move freely and open up what needs to be opened up so there can, the freedom can be realized. And do you find um, in your sessions, you, so you have clients, right? Okay, so, um, so, when, so with your clients, are you seeing a lot of people... Uh, feeling like they shouldn't be feeling certain things and and that causes a lot of extra friction um yeah but they don't put it that way they just go like giving examples like um yeah then they say like yeah there was this challenge and then this arose but yeah you know it doesn't matter because in, there there is nothing and and nobody's doing it and there's actually nothing to do you like they like in spirituality people use like spiritual uh, reasons arguments not to like resist what's happening or what's felt wants to be felt and in our duality world that happens the same but then people use non-dual arguments hmm. actually yeah to bypass the suffering yes the pain yeah. the emotion so then i point towards that that that's what's happening like it's not bad, it's not right or wrong. There's not right or wrong with anything, but um, seeing this mechanism happen is already enough. But we, but when this is not seen, yeah, it just goes on and on and on. You then mean non-duality becomes a way to resist what's happening? Yes, yes. I want to talk about that. So the um, when you say uh, the seeing this mechanism is enough. What, what do you mean by that? We don't have to do anything with it. We don't have to resist bypassing. We don't have to like <clears throat> try to catch it or anything. Like when it's happening, it's already enough to see that that's what's happening. A bypass is arising or the, the need to bypass is arising. The desire to bypass is arising. The desire to put something away is arising. It's enough just to see that. The seeing of it is enough. Mm. We don't need to do anything with it because then we are. Yes, again, yes. Crying. 
<laughs> to get rid of that. <laughs> that was the whole point. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because um, it almost sounds contradictory. On one hand, we often, I say we, I don't know who that means, but uh, people in non-duality say that practice, spiritual practice uh, will just reinforce the illusion of separation or that that I am not there yet and there's things I need to do to achieve yeah. so I can Correct. arrive. Correct. And I, no one's ever going to arrive anywhere. I, no. But so when you uh, work with clients, how do you, how do you sort of um, explain that? Like, in other words, they're working with you yeah. to, to achieve a goal. Well, it's not that, that they, they, there is a goal. There is just, um, there are questions that mm -hmm. arise and then they're answered. And most of, of the things that I talk about is about non duality But there is also this confrontation with these avoidance mechanisms. Because, you know, this illusion of separation thrives on avoidance tension because avoidance is tension it thrives on getting rid of something not feeling something it is actually the protection mechanism because there is still this feeling to to be the need to be protected against suffering so i just point that i just point towards that that if i sense that that's what's happening i point to it but there is not like I don't really give any methods or practices. I never actually never do that. I just point things out whenever we come across it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's powerful because um, people are uh, probably quoted Jim on this a few times now, but uh, <clears throat> Jim Newman calls it a uh, applied non-duality. So when people hear the teachings and they, and they say, okay, there's no one here feeling sad. And that sort of becomes like kind of a mantra or, or some technique to avoid feeling sadness. But yeah, what this imaginary person I'm using as an example, uh, what they're not hearing is that it's actually life full on. Like you wrote, life is like, yeah. there's, there's <laughs> that sort of extra layer of trying to control things and trying to have everything go a certain way. And yeah. this expectation that I'm supposed to feel happy all the time, or I'm supposed to feel yeah. pleasure all the time, or, yeah. you know, I don't know, just this um, imaginary life experience that I think I should be having. Exactly. And, and I think the, point, sorry, go ahead. To point out the sadness has nothing to do with the me, but the me thinks it's its sadness. <laughs> but sadness just arises by itself. It can also arise when someone's already realized. It has yes. nothing to do with the me, but then the me thinks it's my sadness and I somehow have to get rid of it. <laughs> then suffering create, is created. Well, if it's not their sadness, then they don't have to get rid of it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because nobody can ever get rid of something that's already happening. <laughs> yeah. And I've tried to describe it as it feels like a, uh, acceptance but there's no one accepting there's no one doing the accepting but there seems yeah. to be an acceptance if, if yeah. that makes sense yes um, sure I, I also use the word surrender which i point to that as well it's a natural way of just not interfering yeah surrender but as long as that's not heard as someone's like, all right, how do I surrender? Like, oh, I'm going to surrender, yeah, you know, yeah. because it's just a natural, spontaneous thing. Yeah. That is, um, in other words, there's no resistance to life. Uh, exactly. In the sense that here's what I think should happen. Here's what is happening. 
you know, and that space between those two is is where the suffering lies. And and you're trying to like make, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's an impossible task. Yeah, it is. And it's futile. At some For point, no the body mind, the body mind vehicle, which I like to use and to refer, um, really kind of learns the futility of resistance the futility of avoidance and then it kind of goes in a natural surrender there isn't anyone who can make a surrender happen it's not possible but this system can learn as at some point it learned that it's maybe not a great idea to put the fingers in the fire it learned that so it can also at some point learn and the brain can also learn a lot of new by learn by new insights and since the brain, the subconscious mind is the one what's making decisions based on the information that it has and doesn't have, it's great. Talks like these are great because of course there isn't anyone with free will, but there is a brain that learns and makes new decisions based on new information. That's why I talk to people. And sometimes an advice is given. And then I say, there isn't anyone who can follow that advice, but there is a brain that can get an insight. Yeah. Although, make uh, although there might not actually be a brain. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but yeah, true, true. But there is this uh, subconscious mind system who is not actually here. It's just a function. That is making this decisions, apparently. Not really, apparently. There's so much freedom in this. Yeah. The, the biggest, well, a couple of things we mentioned. One is um, knowing that everything is allowed. Um, there's nothing that I shouldn't be feeling. There's not an emotion you can name that you know should be rejected or uh, yeah. pushed away and also um the fact that no one well there is no one which means there is no one to know there is no knowledge there is no one that can know so that was freedom for me because uh that I think that's what extinguished the uh, seeking was the fact that uh, it can't be known. Yeah. There is apparent knowledge, but there isn't anyone who can know. But that takes the piss out of everyone, as far as I'm concerned. You yeah. Know? Like, I, like, even... Uh, it's ungraspable. What you're saying now is ungraspable as long as there is this experience of separation. It's ungraspable. How can I not know? People go like, how? I, I know I'm sitting here. Yeah. No, you don't know. And within that not knowing, because there is no you to know, there is this illusion of knowing. I know. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I knew a lot more uh, before the shift. Um. <laughs> 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 or I thought I did, you know. But yeah, so uh, along the lines of what you were just saying about emotions, I'll read the next one. One of the most profound aspect of creation are emotions. Yeah. Those in resistance will not agree. Those in surrender will. Yes. So, so uh, I know that's what we were talking about, but if you could um, expand on that, uh, like, those in resistance will not agree. Those in surrender will. Yeah. The most profound yes. aspect. Yeah, I'm trying to, I want to wrap my head around that. Yeah, there's just this pointing. What I come across a lot also in this um, search for enlightenment is an avoidance of what already is. Like, this is not good enough. The way I feel now is not good enough. So maybe if I get this enlightenment thing, then I will feel a certain way, have a better experience, feel more happy. It's basically like, yeah, I'll, let's be honest. We all want to get rid of suffering as seekers. Yes. And we think that getting enlightened 
who fin do that job. It's as simple as that. So we don't like emotions. In experienced state of separation, we don't like, especially like the, 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 the sadness, the anger, frustration, those emotions. We don't like it. We only want the other half. So that's why I like to point towards it. Yeah, because it's really an emotional endeavor. Like there are people that sometimes say, like when I ask like, why are you looking for realization? They go like, yeah, I want to figure out the nature of reality or uh, I say, no, no. You don't want to figure out the nature of it. That's what your mind says. You want to feel better. You want to have a better experience because that makes you feel better. That's what you really want. And there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone, every seeker wants that. There's nothing wrong with it. But there is some kind of discomfort with what's happening now. Why one would want to seek for something else. It's a discomfort. It's an, like a, a state that's connected to an emotion of this set, like an emotion. And this is dissatisfaction. So the search for enlightenment has an emotional foundation. We want to feel happy and we think enlightenment will do the job. Yeah, we uh, cannot yeah. possibly want the nature to reveal the nature of reality because we don't know what it is as a seeker. So we cannot want something that we don't know what it is. That's why a lot of people, when realization happens, they're like, oh my God, this is nothing what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I already talked to two people in, in the last two months. They, they both are still speechless. They, they're not non-dual speakers yet. Maybe they will be at some point, but they're like, <laughs> enlightenment was a fantasy. Maybe they'll talk to me on here. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like yeah. to interview people about that. What you're saying is is so profound. And I really think it gets overlooked a lot. Um, because what I'm hearing is that people think enlightenment is just like this permanent state of bliss. And what <laughs> what really it's so hard to describe, but as far as a subjective experience, it's just, like I said earlier, full on, you know, I might get more angry. I, I might get more sad. The sadness might be even deeper than it was ever before yeah. because there's not that yeah. resistance. Whatever no. is arising in this moment is just what's apparently happening. And no. there isn't this, knowing of how my life is supposed to look anymore yeah indeed and so i'm not trying to get it to form to fit into that mold of mm -hmm. my my expectation my yeah. what i think my life is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to yeah. feel yeah. it's just what's you know like that's why people say sitting in a chair but we it's just to emphasize it's not special. It's not bliss. <laughs> Unless your idea of bliss is being somehow uh, at peace with things not being peaceful. Like I've heard uh, being okay yeah. with not being okay or, you know, yeah. this sort of, it's funny how they can both coexist at the same time. This this seeming sadness, but this also this peace that yeah. oh, this is sadness. Yeah. This is life. Yeah. This is just just another taste just of just what's happening. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it just feels good not to have someone who tries to feel good. <laughs> <laughs> That's exhausting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's really exhausting. Yeah. So when well, that falls away, it's just, it just feels good. Yeah. So I cannot say there's like constant bliss, but there are like enough moments during a day that there is this blissful moment. And it's not like, oh, I go like all nuts. 
although sometimes those moments happen as well just wonder uh, kind of appears and then it's just like wow this tree is amazing or wow this bird is like stunning you know these wild moments happen because there is just this this aliveness and this intimacy um yeah but it's not a constant state of bliss like you could say that there is this indescribable sense of peace that lies under every state that can arise like anger sadness or joy mm -hmm. so it doesn't have anything to do with the character feeling good or or, or not yeah it's just the absence of resistance, I think, that creates this, this indescribable peace. So it's not the peace of mind, just like something that lies beneath it. My friend says, there's no peace of mind until you're out of your mind. Yeah. And what yeah, he means the mind by- The will never be peaceful. Huh? Right. And when he's saying mind, he's saying it's like a collection of, um, concepts and beliefs and ideas and all these things and this baggage you know and uh as long as we're thinking from that you know there's no peace to be had um so uh, this teaching explodes the mind you know uncompromising uh, uh, you you mean the uncompromising message Are yes Yes, I mean, it explodes it in the sense that every concept gets, um, gets you know, the, uh, eliminated. It, nothing, <laughs> how, how can I put this? The concepts are seen through to just be bullshit. You know, and all that stuff I had in my mind about if I do this, this will happen. And these um, beliefs, stories, the beliefs, yeah. yeah, the the mind is a storage house of beliefs. And One I, of the I, things, yeah. I think when that when that falls away, um, then this piece that you're saying, it, the piece that passes all understanding, the piece that you described, yeah. that is underneath the pain. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That. But to, to point something out, it doesn't mean that I have zero beliefs. Like there can still be a belief that um, vegetarian food is, is better for my body, mainly to eat mainly vegetarian. That can be a belief. But then a, a friend of mine who's also realized is going like, no, my belief is that, that, that uh, eating uh, meat uh, is uh, very healthy and needed. So there can be like, there can be beliefs, um, but there isn't anyone who's like holding on to them or like trying to defend them. So it doesn't really matter. Hmm. Yes. But I wouldn't say realization is, is an absence of beliefs of all, or, or uh, yeah. Hmm. No. I don't know. I mean, it's just, I think it's the seeing through of the separate individual with free will and choice that is, um, you know, has all these beliefs. Like I don't have beliefs. In other words, like the ownership is not there. It just seems oh, like, so, yeah. you know, if I have a belief, I don't know that, um, what did you say? What was your example? <laughs> Of the food, yeah. Yeah, the, yes. The uh, vegetarian yeah. food is is better for me. Yeah, why not? I think the the beliefs, more or less, what I'm talking about, are about ultimate matters and uh, spiritual things and yeah. higher, whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, <clears throat> um, the search for enlightenment is an avoidance of what is. In the last week prior realization, it didn't matter to me whether or not it happened. I was completely fine with what is. Then it happened. The contracted energy became boundless again. And the funny thing is, I didn't feel enlightened. <laughs> I was laughing because it was realized that there's nobody to get enlightened. The yeah. me was a complete illusion. It was a dream. So it was not special. 
Nobody is special. It's so ordinary. Yet it left me completely speechless that day. Yeah. I love the way you read with the intonation. Oh, Beautiful. thank you. I, I, I always thought I was a terrible reader and um, oh. I, I stumbled through this, but I think it makes it kind of funny because I think people <laughs> could take, uh, can see I don't take myself too seriously. Uh, oh, I love what you do. <laughs> thank you. But um, yeah, contracted energy became boundless again. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So actually, it, the day it happened, um, I, f I didn't feel that I was enlightened or realized that thought didn't arise. It was just like an, an indescribable something that happened that I couldn't explain to myself. I knew that it was like otherworldly because it was not an experience. That's why I had a hard time to like explaining to myself what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the day after the contracted energy started to... Um, release itself it was like everywhere it was in the knees I remember I was lying on my bed and I felt like subtle letting go like it was like really in the flesh it was like a, how can I say like something inside the flesh that let go let go like different areas in my body and that went on for days not constantly but many moments and whenever I was just quiet sitting or lying down I just really felt it um but prior to the contracted energy letting go there was this sensation on the day that it happened that there was a, a transparent foil in front of the eyes that fell of course it was not real uh, it, it, it it was just like an illusion that that was in front of my eyes that stopped happening. And that was the first thing that actually happened. And the day after the contracted energy started to release. Well, maybe it started already, but I just didn't feel it because I was like distracted with what the heck is, what, what is this? <laughs> I was looking around. I remember like I was looking around and the walls were so stunning all of a sudden. <laughs> just simple white walls. And I was like, what, it, what changed actually? Why did the walls look so, so alive? And I went on to other rooms, like to see what changed, but nothing changed. <laughs> yeah, I was just amazed. I couldn't sleep that night because it was just unexp unexplainable. And the day after is when I remember when I looked, the first time I looked in the mirror after that happening, I, I, it was as if I didn't, saw, I didn't saw a reflection of me in the mirror. I saw uh, my body in the mirror. Mm. It was as if uh, you, you, you see a friend of you in the mirror. You don't see a reflection of yourself when you look at them in the mirror, right? You just see their bodies. That's what's happening with me, but not like in a dissociative way that I couldn't know like, who is she. No, of course, that's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and so that was really a practical function of the seeing was different. And I was like, whoa, how is this possible? And then I, I started like to look at myself in the mirror, like, what is this? How is and then it dawned on me that I couldn't locate where the seeing was coming from. The body was seen in the mirror, but there was not, it was not coming from behind the eyes. And that's when I dawned on me that the center was lost. The center of this hooked seeing. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, oh, this is a realization <laughs> mm -hmm. and irreversible. Yeah. And yeah, then the next day, it only like dawned on me that, whoa, 
But before I just didn't have any words. And it felt so completely different from the fantasy that I had about enlightenment that just that thought that this was enlightenment didn't arise because it was just beyond anything that was imagined before as a seeker. Because how can you as an experiencer fantasize about no experience? You can't, it's impossible. Yeah. So no seeker can ever imagine what enlightenment is like. All right. Yeah, I agree with that. I had a lot of uh, ideas about it. I think we covered it a lot, you know, just thinking mostly that it was going to be a permanent state of bliss and um, yeah. this kind of thing. And I think well, let me ask you, like, can you describe uh, before and after a little bit, maybe how things were prior to awakening as, and how things were after awakening? Maybe some, some things, people that might help them. Well, nothing's going to help them, but <laughs> I just like to define what, what we're talking about as, as much as possible to maybe remove any um, any false notions of what enlightenment is. Yeah. So may, yeah. yeah, if you could describe like, where were you at a little prior to and, and, and maybe, and what was that shift like? And, and what are some of the significant differences in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. Yeah, so awakening actually happened, I think, uh, half year prior realization. Um, so in that phase, yeah, it was very intense. From bliss after awakening, a few months of bliss, like an expansion, uh, all the way to a dark night of the will, as one could say, all the way to equanimity being like, yeah, whatever, you know. All is fine. Um, and actually the differences, I don't really see that much differences except for that there is no seeking energy anymore. Like from that day when I told like, it is as if that veil of, of separation fell away. Uh, there was no seeking. Like I remember once I put on Jim Newman and then it just was so boring. As before I was like addicted to those videos and i was like it did, didn't make any sense i was like yeah whatever let's watch netflix <laughs> well i didn't watch netflix for a year a year or something it's really horrible i i lost all interest in like normal stuff when when i had my awakening so yeah there is also no suffering there can be challenges and like trying to figure something out but there's like no 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 suffering as it used to be. Resistance, suffering actually pain plus resistance, discomfort plus resistance. That's not happening here. Um, everything is very transient. So whenever emotion arises, it doesn't stick the whole day. Or, or even if a story arises, it also doesn't stick. It's just like, oh, okay, I have to like, figure that out okay and then just, the, the, there isn't a reoccurring of like oh this is going to happen or why did that happen and the whole day going on and on and on like i used to have that really i was really a thinker like uh, uh yeah so that's that's i think that, that that's really like tension can still arise or hurry or you know that was surprised me <laughs> because I kind of secretly hoped that that would like be gone. But I guess this character is just like very active and just doing a lot of stuff. Um, so I was like hurrying today while I, there was no time pressure any. Like, and I was like, why is this hurrying? Mm. Ah, okay, hurry is happening, whatever. I think like my parents are very, um, how can I say? Yeah, 
they 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 have this energy. So I think this is just conditioning of this character that I saw that, and I was also very um, stressed my whole life, or very like anxious in a way. Not all the time, but but I had my moments a lot. So that's kind of this resemblance that's still in this conditioning. But it's mm. different than it was. Mm. But I just want to point out that I'm not sitting on a bench the whole day and just staring at the sky. Yeah. Constantly. No, it's normal daily life. I see the seeking energy as um, an addiction to more. A more and better. <laughs> yeah, something else. Something than else. What, what is. <laughs> Anything, but not this. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. But how, what did change for you? What it changed for me was, well, when I was saying about beliefs, for example, mm -hmm. um, just I had all these beliefs about, well, let me put it this way. Uh, there's a friend of mine and he was he's sending me videos and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, this will help. Um, this will help uh, eliminate our suffering. And he said that and he sent me a, a video and I and I realized what was happening that <clears throat> we had been doing this for quite some time, but I hadn't realized he was watching these videos, hoping that this, he would learn something that would take away his suffering. Whereas I was just like, oh, we're just exchanging stuff. You know, people do that. Like, hey, check this out, check that out. And uh, yeah, I realized there was a qualitative difference in what, what we were hoping to get out of it. You know, I was just like, oh, maybe I'll hear something interesting, whatever. But there wasn't, um, this desperation. There wasn't this expectation. Yeah. There wasn't. Yeah. I don't need. I don't need anything from the video. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not <laughs> hoping to get anything out of it. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> all there is is this. Yeah. And nobody's <laughs> gonna tell me anything that's gonna change this, or make this better. Because this is already it. <laughs> so I. Yeah. Think what changed was just that I, you know, may, I don't know. It was just, I guess, a lot changed. But that was one thing I can definitely point to, yeah. is that um, there's nothing in me like, if what arises is a desire to make this interview better somehow, by I don't know asking a different question, then I'll do it. That's just what's happening in the moment. That's just what's going to arise. But um, you know, I I don't know. I. <laughs> Did that explain it? Like, I'm not great yeah, with words. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really yeah. a, a speaker. Good example. But um, yeah, there's no video book or speaker or whatever that that I think I'm going to get anything out of or that is going to enhance my subjective experience. No, uh, no. Now, I could watch uh, TV later and that could give me a good experience. I could laugh, or, you know, I think my wife just came home. We'll probably have dinner later. That, that'll that be a nice experience. Um, but this enlightenment with the, you know, the uh, fireworks or whatever, all the bells and whistles, you know, that's all bullshit. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't get any better than this. No, no. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah, I don't know actually how 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 we got into this fantasy as a seeker of alignment because it's just a projector projection with where where does that stem from I, I remember like I thought when I read the book of Eckhart Tolle I kind of didn't think that I would be, ever become in line I just didn't even shoot for that that was I think like five or six years five years ago four years ago uh, for the first time I, I got into spirituality with reading that book, I tried to be conscious. That's what I dare to shoot for. So I don't even shoot for enlightenment because I thought like that's something really special or far away or, or not, not reachable. Like that, that didn't even sound appealing to me. 
Mm. Because I thought you you kind of lose your humanness or you don't enjoy life. It's immediately some kind of projection that was made. Oh yeah. People are projecting all the time. That's in the beginning. That's why I read that thing that you wrote about uh, messaging, because um, I can see it. Somebody just messaged me about what they think about you know me um, doing these interviews, and I won't say what they said, but they think that I know something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of projections in there. And I, I just, all I could do is disavow people of any specialness that they want to put on me. Um, you know, like when I asked, um, who am I thinking? Oh, Ariana for an interview. She said, I don't know anything. You know, she just wanted to make it clear that I didn't, when I was getting ready for the interview that, you know, I knew that she, <laughs> and I said, I don't either. This is going to be perfect. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, that, that type of humility is something that yeah. can come from this as well yeah. is it's this knowing that you don't know, but nobody knows yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Words just arise. And, and indeed it's not, we don't talk from learned knowledge. Yes, it's talking is just happening, and somehow the brain becomes more function, more efficient because it doesn't lose energy on trying to come off good or try to come off smart or whatever the self image is, imposed self image is. Um, so it kind of grabs the right words at the right moment more effortlessly. That's really a, a progression in the brain if there is no that contracted energy that, that that's obstructing like uh, the effortlessness or that can obstruct the effortlessness um but there is no no fixed ideas there is no fixed truth from which i talk there is no no belief system or like religion, like this is what's right and i have to talk about that so other people will also agree with what I say and also believe what I say. There is no fixedness. Mm. There is no center where this knowledge or knowing lies that can like be shared. There's just spontaneity. Mm. Yeah, and one day I can just say something and then the other day I can completely contradict it. That's amazing. Like oh, life yeah. really loves to show <clears throat> up in a complete contradiction. I remember like it happens all the time. Like I was talking to a friend. Uh, I said like, I really feel rich because I don't need much. And he said, yeah, that's basically also my lifestyle. And hour, one hour later, I found myself in a store almost buying expensive shoes because I thought they were really warm and comfortable. And I deserve to having like comfortable shoes. <laughs> yeah. For this winter. So I was ready to spend more money on it. And I was like, yeah, it's a complete contradiction. I just said, I don't need much. But now I all of a sudden I was like, yeah, I really need those shoes because it's really cold. So life constantly plays. It's really like a playful puppy. It constantly shows you that there is no fixedness. There is no fixedness. You cannot say anything about anything. You cannot yes. say I'm this, I'm that. It's too spontaneous. Absolutely. I, I've noticed that from doing these interviews too, because um, uh, like uh, these are all recent, everything I'm reading, which I, I learned is probably the best thing to do is get the most recent because sometimes I'll get stuff the person wrote a few years prior to the interview and they, yeah. they no longer identify with the things that they said. And, and that's so true. Like this interview, I might have said a few things that I, I'll listen to, you know, a month from now. Yeah. And like, oh, I might cringe at it, but I still know yeah. it's just whatever's arising in the moment, even if it's different than what arises in the next moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is no fixed someone that can be fixed in a fixed way. There just isn't. 
And you know, the, the, the illusion of separate, like the, the, the seeker really um, wants to hold on to something like that, a fixed idea of itself, because that gives this illusory sense of safety. Yes. That's very misleading because then one feels safe that I am this, I'm this way. So then I must be safe. Well, no, there's actually nothing to hold on to. There's no fixedness at all. Like the one moment I can be like, oh, I really don't need that much sugar. And then the other moment I'm like, oh, I really love this chocolate piece. I really want to eat it. <laughs> well, you, you, I've heard, uh, I listened to your YouTubes and you use the word lack. So you say um, it's not coming from a place of lack. So a feeling of uh, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough. Uh, if yeah. I, so if I have these shoes, maybe I can be accepted. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. well, maybe uh -huh. people will look at me and be like, wow, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I have these shoes. Yeah. Well, you, you just said you wanted them because they were warm, not yeah. necessarily because you uh, came from a place. And I liked, yeah. I liked the way they looked. I liked the way they looked as well. Not, they were not only warm, but indeed, it's not coming from a sense of lack. That there is something that I need to enhance myself or my self-image with something external. And therefore, I need that. And it's very important that I get that. And I have that. Yeah. So, yeah. That's actually, like, the funny thing is, like, a lot of people in this uh, manifestation uh, world, you know, within spirituality, there's this world of manifestation of abundance and money and et cetera. Like, I was, uh, a few years ago, before spirituality, I was also interested in that. I kind of, like, also made a vision board and, and did those things. You're talking about law of attraction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, a, a lot of uh, people... Um, who talk about it or like motivate other people um, are talking about abundance. Yeah. But if you really look closely, if you're trying to manifest more than you actually need for your basic needs, you're not doing that because you feel abundant. Putting that effort in, trying to manifest it, journal about it, make a vision, like putting like really extra energy into it. Like you can just also sit in the sun and just stare at the sky for a while. But no, you're the whole day you're like working more, 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 more. It's coming from lack. Yes. So it's not abundance. Someone who's really abundant doesn't put so much effort into more, more, more. Of course, if money makes itself, there's none. Of course, why not? If a company is already running and someone is like a million, there's nothing against more and more. But like every day, putting an effort and um, exchanging it for time, freedom of time and, and help in order to get more. Well, one already has a house and clothes and food and a vacation. That comes from a place of lack. Mm. So it's very misleading when people put it off as abundance. No, you don't feel abundant. You feel lack. Mm -hmm. And you already have two million on the bank, but you feel still feel lack. And you know you need four million and it never ends. So it's very misleading. So that's something that I will make a video about it as well, because I still a lot, a lot of seekers that are um, reading about non-duality, they're still asking questions about manifestation. So it's really uh, something that's really still in the minds of people, so to say. Yeah. Um, some, not all, of course. Some. I had experience uh, with that as well. And um, what I did was, well, I realized, what was I looking for? And this isn't stuff that I came up with myself, but um, uh, just over the years, working with different people, whatever. But the message was, well, what it was a feeling that I was looking for, right? A feeling of peace, contentment, um, a feeling of whatever the opposite of lack uh, yeah. or the opposite of separation. Yeah. Um, 
safety uh, and freedom. Yeah, safety. Yes. yes. Um, peace, comfort. So th all these things. Fulfillment. Um, yeah. And so I focused on the feeling rather than the thing, because it was never about the thing. Oh. So let's say the shoes. <laughs> I think the shoes are going to make me happy. So I buy the shoes. Yeah. I just skipped the middle man. And I said, yeah, I'm this just going to, I'm yeah. going to manifest this feeling without getting the thing. Yeah. Without going for the money, without going for the material yeah. stuff. And um, that was pretty good exercise. I mean, it was, you know, eventually I just let it all go, but um, yeah. I'd say prior to realization, if that's the word we're using, um, that's where I was at. I was just like yeah. focusing on the feeling. So why did you let it go? That I'm curious. At, at some point, we all let that phase go. But what made? What do you think that made it let you yeah, let you go? What inside or, or or what was it? I think it was the fact that um, <laughs> I don't. I don't. How can I put it into words? That's a good question. Um, what made me let it go? Well, I was doing this practice, so I, I want to feel happy, joy, peace. What what does peace feel like? So then I would imagine, what, oh, yeah. what, what would it feel like to be peaceful? You know? Feel the feeling, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I would feel the feeling of peace. Yeah. Almost like we were talking about, I didn't have a clue what uh, enlightenment was, but I sort of, imagine what it would be like and yeah. i would you know and i would sort of be able to conjure up these pretty good feelings inside and but they didn't you know continue through the whole day like we just said this is not enlightenment uh, this permanent state of peace but that's what i thought it was so then when the shift happened and i just saw there's no one here doing anything you know anything. <laughs> in other words that was just what was happening but i wasn't doing it those thoughts and ideas were what was arising. These, these thoughts about manifestation and whatever. Yeah. Um, but that just all fell away. It's hard to describe why, but why did I stop? I guess, you know, it's the spiritual workaholism. This like, I don't want to spend time doing that anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah Trying yeah. to create a feeling uh, yeah. or using my imagination. I don't, I just want to, you know, life full <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm not trying yeah. to create something apart from what is exactly you know yeah. this is yeah. this is all that's that is and and i but felt like that's I was, a that's yeah, a great to... insight that's a a really non-dual insight uh, so to say for me i let go of manifestation while i didn't know about enlightenment yet but i basically let go of it because i was um i felt like a fraud like I wasn't feeling joyful, then therefore I did this practice or generating joy. And then I was like, yeah, I'm a fraud. I don't feel joy. And now I'm like faking as if I'm joyful. What is this? And then I let that whole practice go. <laughs> or maybe yeah. it really worked. <laughs> well, it always worked for a while. And then I had to do it again. And I was like, yeah, it's too much effort. Always yeah. trying to feel a certain way. I kind of felt that there was something like something was like not. I felt there was something to it, like trying to feel a certain way. It it really didn't feel comfortable. That trying. Yeah. Because whenever I didn't feel that way, or it just lasted for half a minute, I was frustrated. Right. Yeah, and this isn't about getting into a state or achieving a state. Um, not at all, not at all, no, no, no. You say. Enlightenment is actually also the absence of trying to get something else than what is. And that doesn't mean that the, ha, doing things doesn't happen, of course. Um, I'm trying to make food, so I will later have some food to eat. It's also a form of trying, but it's not like, this has to be gone so I could get something else instead of it. Pushing yeah. away and pulling yeah. that mechanism, that dynamic doesn't arise anymore. 
Yeah, it's kind of like, I don't know, uh, I exercise, I, I brush my teeth, I do all kinds of things to take care of myself. And, yeah. you know, but I'm just not trying to get anywhere. It's just like, yeah, it's just what's happening. Exercise. You can only, yeah, yeah, you can only try to get something else when you experience yourself separate from it. Mm. And you can kind of push it away. But when that experience stops happening, you cannot pu push it away anymore because what, what is there to push and who are going to push? Those are not like jewel anymore. I've not experienced as to be jewel. Yeah. It's just one whole thing. So there's nothing to push away. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. experiencer is no longer ex is separate from the experience. Yeah. Or not that the experiencer ever was. No. It just seemed like it was. So let's, uh, P.S., it says, being special is not worth the fun because the moment you don't feel special, you will suffer. Transcending being special not being special is worth the fun. Transcendence of suffering is for those who are okay with suffering. Those who are still running from suffering are prisoners of emotions and shadows. The, dedication, the dedicated seeker for freedom runs toward suffering when it arises in desperate need to liberate it by fully feeling everything and anything that is arising. Mm. Wow. Warriors conquer freedom by surrender. There's a lot of good stuff in that. Anything you want to say about transcending, transcendence? Yeah, it's kind of moving beyond being special, the need to be special, or the need to not be special at all, the need to be humble, like that happens a lot with seekers. All of a sudden, there is like, no, it's not arrogance. It's humbleness, humble. So there is like someone trying to be humble. That's actually the same as someone trying, like acting arrogant. It's the same, two ends of the same stick. So yeah, being special or being humble. Of course, there can be this, this natural humbleness that arises, but nobody trying to be humble, nor nobody trying to feel special. Because it's a burden. Being special is a burden because you have to uphold that self-image of someone that is better than others, that has something that others don't have. So whenever you seem normal, then there will be some suffering arising. Yeah. And what do you mean when you talk about running towards suffering? Yeah, I'm pointing to a phase uh, during awakening, right before awakening and after awakening, uh, prior realization. Um, I didn't hide anymore from anything that arose. So I remember when I used to talk to someone or I overheard someone, like uh, mothers on, on, on the school, when I was picking up my daughter and someone like would kind of like irritate me with what they said or the way they acted. I wouldn't avoid them. I would walk towards them in curiosity. Like, what is it in me that's not free? What is this trigger? What is this shadow? What is this emotion? What is this sensation? So I was kind of like walking towards suffering, walking, trying to figure out what's not free here. All I did prior realization is to find out why I'm not feeling free. I am free, but I don't feel that way. So every stone that appeared, I was turning it around in order to find what's not, what's still not free, chunk for chunk. So I walked towards my suffering. So whenever pain arose, I was like, oh, this is a good chance to feel it. Mm. Something that's not free, that wants to be liberated. That's why it's arising. So yeah, that, that's actually a war, 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 warrior mentality. Warrior mentality, right? That's pronounced yeah. it the right way. Warrior, yeah, definitely. Yeah, someone who, who's like not hiding. Mm. Not hiding. Yeah, a spiritual warrior. It's like warrior. ready to, for, con for confrontation, to confront itself with 
with whatever whatever is still I don't know whatever is still not feeling free or not feel safe to be free. Hmm. Because say, it's all about safety, yeah. yeah. If the body feels safe to feel discomfort and suffering, it goes into surrender by itself. It happens by itself. The body mind goes into a, some kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever arises, it's fine. I, I don't want like to use the word trust because it's not about trusting in something or trusting life or trusting that everything will be fine because we don't know, maybe I'll die in an hour. But it's about some kind of a... How, how to say this? Hmm. A feeling of that there is only perfection, that intuitive sensing that there is only perfection, even if that turns out to be something that I at least expect. Yes. There's only and that's so something that I kept reminding myself in those last phases prior to realization, whenever like frustration or resistance or like um, discomfort would arise, I would confirm like, this is also perfection. I know it doesn't feel as nice as joy, but this is also it. This is also the absolute. This is also it. This look, this is also it. Nothing is not it. Yes. <clears throat> I kept confirming, like I kind of brainwashed myself as a seeker in the last months. And the uncompromising message kind of really helped me in that, in that to seeing that there, there is no me. So there's nothing to oppose. There's nothing to be, get rid of. Everything is it. Oh yeah, that was so liberating. But it really, the body-mind people had to learn it because the mechanism, the automatic mechanism was still sometimes was resistance and avoidance or like trying to get something and get rid of something. So the body-mind people had to learn this, the subconscious mind, like the, 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 the nervous system had to learn that it's safe to feel in a way. Yes. By exposure, 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 constant exposure. Um, so that was the work that was done. Of course, I cannot look, I cannot look back and, and rewrite, re rewrite history and say that, oh, that's what I did. That's why I got realized fast or anything like that. I cannot say that because I cannot rewrite history. Maybe it would happen if I was just doing, doing anything, but I doubt it. I don't know. Uh, but this was the work that was done as a seeker. Mm. In combination of watching on duality videos. I used to read um, William Blake and he said, um, as it, in, as it is within, it is without, inside our imagination, of which this world is but a shadow. Yeah, yeah. And, and I used to really love that because I'm like, wow, this is like all a projection, you know, the suffering. And when you talk about running towards it, I mean, it's a projection of mind. So <laughs> it's like, it's in other words, it seems to be coming from here. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's no way to run from it. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. uh, as it is within, it is without, you know, this, this world is but a shadow of our internal condition. And if that, like you said, is one of lack and and always wanting more and better and faster, then then that's what that's what our life looks like. You know? Yeah. It's it's definitely it, a reflection of, of what's going on inside. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting 
not to go about to judge like so a lot of people that then find out about this and then judge themselves for being a certain way it was really interesting like what makes me move what makes all these desires arise what's the basis lack belief that i'm a separate being that has to make its life work have a free will and choice to make it work go to the root belief mm. that that creates this this contraction in everything that we engage in. Yeah, I heard you talk about limiting beliefs and things like that. And um, yeah. so I think it's true that um, we come up with these ideas of, of how we should be and what what's wrong with us or what's what's wrong with the world and other people. And, you know, these beliefs are... Um, like you said, they just come out of this, this false idea of ourselves and they limit us. Yeah. And the idea that if we will be a certain way, then we will be happy if that happens. That's like a false projection that if I am this way, then I will be happy. Hmm. You don't know that. Right. <laughs> that's an right. assumption that is believed in by many if I become uh, looking like this or behaving like this or having this talent and qualities, then I will be happy. Usually when, when that moment arrives, people <laughs> find out they're still not happy. <laughs> so that's really uh, interesting just to inquire. Like, is it really the, how do I really, am I really sure I will be happy? Or just even just to explore why we are doing the things we do. Like if we're still a seeker, there's still this ex experience of separation. It might be interesting. Yeah. It can be very interesting. What's, what's the motivation? What lies underneath it? Yeah. It's, it starts off with a self-discovery until we realize there is no self. <laughs> uh, you know, all that was, was helpful, I think. Um, I, cause I would look at, you know, times in my life when I had, I think I thought I had everything in the right place. You know, I had yeah. all the, I had all the things and I was like, see, I wasn't that happy then, you know, or, or you could look at a celebrity that has all that stuff yeah. and, and you see that they're not happy. So it's, uh, I don't know where we came up with this idea that having certain things would, would equal happiness well i have yeah. so many more quotes from you but uh we're approaching the 90 minute mark so i won't get to them um just trying to see if there was one last one it's so obvious we came here to celebrate unconditional freedom and unconditional love indeed yay <laughs> maybe you could just say a few things about unconditional love and then we'll we'll wrap it up and um We'll do that. Yes. So yeah, yes. unconditional love. What do you think? I think it's the fullness, the emptiness arising as fullness. So the unconditional freedom appearing as unconditional love. No thing being everything. It's really a celebration of love, which is actually very free. Um, because there is nothing. Actuality. So it's an appearance of a paradox while there are no two. What? <laughs> it seems like a paradox. Uh, so yeah, I think it is indeed a celebration. It's an honor. It's a, it's a gift to have this mind-blowing aliveness appearing as the way it is appearing. Yeah. So I'm still, every moment that is a celebration. Well, thank you for celebrating this moment with me. Yeah, it's so enjoyable. Thank you. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, Enjoy it. Is there anything you can uh, share with the folks at home? You want to plug something? Tell them how to find you. Uh, tell them about your website or your your yeah. services as far as you, you take on clients, something like that. You want to mention that? Yeah. Yeah. 
So if, if people want to follow me on YouTube, they can go and subscribe to Nargis. My name is in here. And then just enter non-duality. Uh, they will find me on YouTube. My website will be soon up in uh, a few weeks. Um, it's unconditional-freedom.com. People can apply for a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a session. I also talk to people who have already experienced uh, realization and just um, want to have a normal conversation and with no seeking or questions at all. That's also possible. Um, yeah, I have an Instagram, which is my name, nargis.no.thing, where I post my quotes and pictures and just writings and funny things as well. Yeah, yeah fun, very funny. I got, a, I, I got a good laugh out of the one where you say <laughs> that you never saw the Matrix. <laughs> no, I never saw the Matrix. Yeah. And I still don't, don't, don't feel like watching the movie. I don't know why. Maybe that will happen uh, sometime, but it didn't. I enjoyed That was like my first TikTok, TikTok that I made. Oh. And I also have a non-duality meme page. Do you know about memes? I, I'm sure you, you, don't, you know. Do I, I know? I don't know if you have uh, I non might follow it. Tell, can you tell me what it is? I'll tell you if I follow. Yeah, it's non-duality dot memes. I think I do. It's on uh, Instagram. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's all. So you. That, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have my picture there because it's just like a a meme page. Uh, but but I I sometimes enjoy making those creating those memes. So if people are are into non-duality and memes, that's like a perfect combination. I just share it because there's sometimes this funny energy that arises. So yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. I like non-duality memes. Uh, <laughs> well, I really appreciate that. I'm grateful to you for being here with me today. And thank you everybody thank you. for watching. Yes. Thank this you. It was wonderful. Thank Very you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, Walter. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.